The uh, title of my talk uh, is, I'm told, has announced the elephant, the tiger, and the cell phone, the transformation of India in recent years. And the truth is that um, the title needs some explaining. Uh, it is actually the title of one of my recent books in India, in the English language. I'm sorry, it doesn't exist in Spanish. And the reason I use that title was a very simple metaphor. And that metaphor was an animal fable. You know, India is the land of the animal fables. Those of you who have read fables from Aesop, uh, Aesop's fables may not realize that he got his stories from India, from the ancient Panchatantra and Hitopadesha, which were available to him in ancient Greece. So the stories of animals have been part of the culture of India. And in this uh, very simple metaphor, I spoke of India as an elephant, a large, ponderous beast, mired in its own dust and mud, covered in flies, slow to move, slow to change, which in recent years appears to have been acquiring the stripes of a life, agile and sinewy tiger. Why did I do this? Well, India had a reputation for some decades after its independence for being slow to grow and slow to change. Part of the reason had actually to do with a very deliberate set of policy choices by our nationalist leaders. You know that India was a colony for almost 200 years under the British. And our nationalist leaders fought long and hard to win our independence against colonial rule. And they were very conscious that the British East India Company had come to India to trade and stayed on to rule. So in our nationalist movement, there was a lot of suspicion of foreign capital. The assumption was that those who came to trade really had a secret agenda to control your country politically, which only goes to prove that one of the lessons you learn from history is that history can sometimes teach you the wrong lessons. But the truth is that as a result of that, our nationalist movement decided not to integrate with the global capitalist system of the world but rather to protect itself, because they believed that the only way you could protect your political independence was by ensuring your economic independence. And so the protectionist barriers went up, self-reliance became our mantra, and the first few decades after our independence in 1947, we spent with bureaucrats rather than businessmen on the commanding heights of the Indian economy. And I'm afraid we spent a lot of time trying to regulate stagnation, subsidize unproductivity, and distribute poverty. This is a great example of how the best intentions can le lead to the wrong actions. This is why India had a reputation as a very slow-moving elephant. Economic growth averaged 1.5 to 3 percent in all those first four decades after independence. It was even called by an Indian economist the Hindu rate of growth. But the truth is, that in that same period, India was able to lay a platform for its future development. It laid industries which had never existed under the British, because the British saw the colony as a place to exploit natural resources and send them to Britain. So there was no platform of, of industry in India that was done. It laid a major platform for education. The British were not particularly interested in advancing education in India. And when they left India after almost 200 years of rule, the literacy rate in India, four years after the British left, was 18%. So there was a major challenge in educating a population that had been deliberately left behind to be ignorant. In addition to that, there was a need, very strongly felt by our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, to promote science, technology, and excellence in the what he thought of as the 20th century disciplines. So India set up world-class institutes in uh, Indian Institutes of Technology, major institutes in the advancement of scientific research, and all of this, we were able to see the benefits later 
when India became an IT powerhouse, the part of the world where information technology became the engine of growth and development in the future. So what we saw through the 1990s, when economic reform began to be practiced in India, what we saw was a, an attempt to move away from the protectionist dogmas that I have described to you to a much more open attitude to the world economy, particularly in this era of globalization. And when the world globalized and when India in parallel opened up its economic opportunities, you saw the elephant becoming a tiger. You saw a dramatic growth. India suddenly went from the so-called Hindu rate of growth I've been telling you about to systematically growing above 8%, 9%, one or two years was even 10%. You found a tremendous spurt in information technology and scientifically based industries and professions, largely because we already had by the 1990s the world's second largest pool of trained scientists and engineers. And many of them had a mathematical aptitude that prepared them well for the kind of work that computers required, the software programming, the coding. This was some, something that Indians could do, and there were large numbers of Indians who could do. It helped, of course, that the 1990s were also the decade in which the world became better connected with the laying of extensive fiber optic cables around the world, with the advent and development of satellite technology, we got to the point in the 1990s where you could sit in India and do work for people in the United States. And that, India became the first country to exploit. We had young Indians, well-educated in the uh, English language, able to sit in call centers or business processes, business process outsourcing offices in India and connect to clients in the United States, developing an ability to service their needs without leaving the shores of India. Either the use of satellites or the use of cabling, it didn't matter. The world had become more globalized and more knitted together, and India became a particular exponent of the art of the late 20th century communications technology for the purpose of economic advancement. So suddenly new professions came up. Young people were coming out of universities and joining companies which were internationally oriented. From being a relatively closed and protected a protectionist economy, India transformed itself into one of the most globalized countries in the world. And this transformation is the transformation of the elephant to the tiger. So then where does the third term in my title come in, the cell phone? Well, I thought that the cell phone to me, as somebody who left India to go to study in America in 1975, but who kept coming back every year and saw the changes, the cell phone to me was emblematic of this transformation of the elephant to the tiger. Why do I say that? Well, when I left India in 1975, there were perhaps 600 million Indians, today there are double that, but 600 million Indians, there were only 2 million landline telephones in the entire country. So telephones were a rare instrument. If you weren't an extremely influential politician or journalist or a very wealthy businessman or a doctor, you might not even get a telephone. Even if you applied for one, you may have to wait many years to get it. What is more, our service and our connections were so poor that very often the telephone sat in your living room and when you picked it up every morning hoping for a dial tone, you found no dial tone. 